Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 73, the disillusioned doctoral student. I can't tell you how many emails I receive from around the world that begin with the phrase, I'm so desperately unhappy. Now, I have a bit of an ambivalent relationship with happiness that we'll talk about in a second, but I received a great list of vlog requests from the wonderful Loretta. Hi, Loretta. And one of her requests was great because it said, how do I handle being disillusioned? Now, I love the word disillusioned because it suggests a certain amount of consciousness about one's life, that you'd gone into Conrad's heart of darkness and returned, or you'd gone into the Matrix and, yes, taken the red pill. I've always described growing up as managing disappointment. Life is cruel, life is nasty, and on a daily basis we have to put up with some pretty bad behaviour most of the time. And look, a lot of the people that we meet are ignorant, foolish, selfish, naive. And that's just at universities. And it's not really surprising that all of us get a bit disillusioned at times. And I made a decision to work in universities when we all could have earned a lot more money elsewhere. I decided to work in universities because I believe that universities must represent the best of a culture, a place of kindness and decency and integrity and wisdom and intelligence. Basically, if Yoda wasn't a Jedi Knight, he would work in a university. But the problem is, we fall below that threshold of decency and respect and kindness and intelligence really, really often. And that's why I think a lot of you have seen when people say the unsayable to me in meetings, and you've seen me either laugh at those people or indeed just sort of throw them a bit of shade. And let me give you a few examples of things that have been said to me in the last year or so. I've been called girly in a meeting and I was in my 40s and a dean when I was called girly, bless. Uh, you write journalism, don't you? As if writing journalism is equivalent to mopping a toilet floor. I always laugh to people who abuse the writing of journalism. When you look at their CV, they've never written journalism. So good luck with that. Another great phrase I've got in the last year is, you're more of a teacher than a researcher. Like you can't be both. And my personal favourite, this was from an email from a bloke that I've never actually met. Quote, you've really neglected your husband and your family. I'm so thankful I'm not married to you. End of quote. Don't you always love how there are certain men that just assume we're all just sort of waiting somewhat breathlessly to be married to them? Yawn. Now, I wanted to reply to this email. If you were the last man on this earth, I would choose bestiality or the convent. But I didn't write that because I'm hashtag classy. So where it gets a bit serious, I think, is when our colleagues, our supervisors, our fellow students in a university say the unsayable to us. And we obviously get disillusioned. That's quite a natural response to that behaviour because it feels like you are being personally and professionally shredded. And that's because you are. So I spend a lot of time with my students getting them to feel very centred getting them to feel in control of their environment. They maybe can't decide or determine what other people say about them, but they can determine and decide how they respond to it. So I'm going to offer some quick strategies for you when bad stuff happens, when hurtful, yucky, disgraceful things occur in a university and you start to feel disillusioned. So if you are having a bad day, this might be a vlog to park and to use and deploy to help you get back to yourself. So here are some quick strategies that do actually work. One, be clear and be honest about what is important to you. Everything really starts here. It's incredibly important that you articulate with great consciousness what is important 
to you. And the best way to do this with great honesty and really, really quickly, there's one technique to do it, and that is think about what you'd like people to say at your funeral. Think about what you'd like someone to say in your eulogy. So what would you like people to remember about you and remember about your life? Now, this was quite a surprising one for me, but also incredibly helpful because I suddenly realized that what I'd really like to be remembered for is that I was actually a good teacher someone who enabled people to become inhabited, fully occupied in their life, to enable them to become their best self. And particularly, I wanted that to occur for people who hadn't come from a posh background, who had been knocked about a bit by life, and to help those people really feel like they belong in a university and they can get the best out of it. So that's it really. I'm incredibly proud of the books. I'm incredibly proud of all the articles. I'm incredibly proud. I've made a living as a professional writer. That's great. But actually, the people matter more. Also, in a time when you hear lots of people talk about the importance of the posh or the elite universities, and I've worked at a lot of those, uh, I've suddenly realised I have actually no great interest in that. The greater sense of satisfaction I've got in my life is when I've worked in the tough towns and the tough cities and the tough regions and the tough universities. And I've met the best students and the best academics there in those places that the system tends to neglect. So that's been very important to me too. So once you think about that in the context of your own life, you get yourself really honest really quickly, then you stop living through other people's priorities for your life. You focus on what is important to you and how you make your life meaningful. Two, surround yourself with people who support you and don't undermine you. Universities are, let's be frank, pretty despicable places sometimes. Places of jealousy, envy, greed, nastiness, self-absorption. Now, don't engage with these people. Just blank them. Don't deal with these people. The problem you've got is if one of those people is actually your supervisor. And yes, I had a shallow, self-absorbed supervisor. And trust me, these supervisors are the gift that keep on giving through your entire life. But if you can, to manage that type of behaviour, create a cohort of PhD students around you who are offering you support. Now, in some environments, it gets really bad because it's a competitive environment between PhD students. And I find that a really unproductive space. At its best, try and create a community of PhD students and you can all help each other with kindness and decency and intellectual generosity. Mm. Three, don't make the PhD bigger than it actually is. Yes, it is an important qualification, but you had a life before your PhD, and yes, I promise you, you will have a life after your PhD. The PhD should improve your life. It shouldn't crush it. So keep it in perspective. Nat, I'm talking to you. Keep it in perspective and don't allow the progress of the thesis to determine how you think about yourself as a person. Separate the person from the PhD. They're different. Four, oh yeah, disconnect from the opinion of others. Mm-hmm. We've already talked about staff and students in a university and their impact on you, but you can also become really disillusioned by the attitudes of your family and your friends. It is great to have supportive family and friends around you. I know a lot of you out there watch these vlogs with your partner, with your family, and that gives them a sense of what you're going through and helps them understand what a PhD is about, and that's terrific. But I also do really understand, I really get, the consequences of, of negative comments from family and friends on you. 
My father, Big Kev, big respect to Big Kev, is currently 89 years of age, sprightly and fabulous. But he, of course, had me somewhat late in life. So that meant when I enrolled in my PhD, he had already retired. So he had a bit of time on his hands. And every single day that I was doing a PhD, Kevin would say to my mother, Doris, Tara will never work, you know. She'll never work, you know. She's a professional student. She'll never get an actual job. She'll never work, you know. To this day, I have it in my head. She'll never work, you know. She'll never work, you know. Okay. But then a year, <laughs> but then a year into the PhD, of course, I got that full-time academic job in Wellington. And my starting salary was higher than the salary that Kevin finished on as a foreman in an oil refinery. And I always remember taking the call from my soon to be head of department for the Wellington job. And they said, you've got the job. And I put the phone down and I walked out into the lounge room where Kevin and Doris were. I said, guys, I've got the job. I'm heading off to Wellington in three weeks. My father was so stunned. He didn't appear to speak for several days. And can I just say, Kevin is a great person, but he was simply frightened that I would never actually get a job. And we're not people of great money, you know, we were never going to be relied on mummy and daddy paying the bills or a partner paying the bills. The buck had to stop with me, so he was trying to protect me. But you've got to keep people around you who believe in what you are doing. If you live your life by other people's values and other people's criteria, you are going to be disillusioned. You are going to be a guest star in your own life. So try and maintain a sense of who you are, a sense of what is important to you, and then you won't be pulled into other people's views about what they think you should be doing. Five, this is a big one for me. Choose satisfaction and not happiness. Choose satisfaction and not happiness. There's a lot of stuff on the planet at the moment about happiness. And I've received four separate requests for vlogs on how to be happy. And it's the one vlog you know, I've tried to write for about a year and I haven't got a lot to say because you know I can't make another person happy. I can't even come up with strategies to make another person happy. But what I can suggest to you today is that your focus could and should be a little bit different. Start to move from happiness to satisfaction. And William Davies wrote what I think is probably in my top 10 books written in the last decade. And this book was titled The Happiness Industry, How Governments and Big Business Sell Us Well-Being. Great book, William Davies, The Happiness Industry. Now, I love this book. He argues that life is so incredibly tough at the moment. Stress, misery, illness, and yet all the focus is on individuals becoming happy rather than offering a really deep critique of what exactly is happening on this planet right now. So Davies argues that, quote, unhappiness and depression are concentrated in highly unequal societies end of quote. Boom. Wow. So I, I often think about, and I try to advise you guys, to think about those moments when you were happiest in your life. So just let that flood you for a moment. Think about when you were happiness, happiest in your life. Those moments should come to you immediately. So for me, the happiest moment in my life was New Year's Eve 1994, as it clicked over into 1995. I was at Connections nightclub with my best friends in the world, and we were on the dance floor dancing, and the first song of 1995 was the Pet Shop Boys Go West. And we were all dancing, we were bouncing up and down, we were having a fantastic time, and I knew right in that moment that that was the greatest moment of my life. And I was actually right. That was the greatest moment of my life. Five months later, I did go to Wellington and life got really hard, really fast, pretty quickly. And it stayed pretty hard ever since. But I also think about the great Christmases I spent with Steve in England. These are times of great happiness. But these are peaks in life. They're so precious because they are 
rare. So those moments are not actually comparable to the rest of our lives. So if we spend our lives chasing happiness, then inevitably we're going to be disappointed and disillusioned. That's why I think, and asking you today, to just ponder about moving from searching for happiness for searching for satisfaction. So think about what can give you satisfaction. Finishing that chapter, marking that pile of assignments, having a really great field work, the experiment operated effectively. Yay! You go into an archive and you find that key text you've been looking for, or you've finally developed a theory and it nests beautifully in your doctorate. They're moments of satisfaction. So start in your life to go for satisfaction. Six, keep learning. One way to stop being disillusioned is to keep moving. Keep yourself moving in intellectually interesting directions. It stops complacency. So keep reading, challenge yourself, move outside of your comfort zones. Read something unusual, something that's outside of your discipline, and it will keep you fresh, it'll keep your vocabulary expanding, and it'll keep your brain thinking about new connections in interesting ways. Don't be frightened about difference, welcome difference, and most importantly, keep learning. Seven, oh yes. Remember that popularity is overrated. Remember all the popular kids in high school? Mm -hmm. Well, where are they now? Mm -hmm. So just remember popularity is overrated. The best research, the most important research has started with doubt and attacks and fear. It's unpopular. So don't aim for popularity. Aim for rigor. Aim to unsettle. Aim to question common sense rather than reinforce common sense. What I'm asking you to do, and a lot of you have heard me say this, is be brave. I want you to be a brave PhD student. I want you to conduct brave research. I always remember Galileo in times like this. He had courage without question. Galileo had to stare down a pope you can stare down some random guy on Twitter. Eight, <laughs> maintain low expectations. This mantra always unsettles people, maintain low expectations. And indeed in my office, the staff in my office are absolutely horrified by this. So hello to Nat, hello to Carrot. I told you I would do a shout out to you both. Uh, they think they're horrified that I maintain low expectations because they are women that maintain incredibly high expectations. So we live in a culture that's all about high expectations. We want everyone to care, everyone to look fabulous, everyone to be nice to us. We expect a great job, a great boss, a great relationship, great. And the problem is, if you have high expectations, you get disappointed and disillusioned really, really easily and quickly. So I have incredibly low expectations of everything. People, jobs, relationships, everything. Low expectations. But what that means is, when something great does happen, I'm surprised every single time. It's like, wow, something amazing has happened. Someone has done something really nice. That's fantastic. So that means, and you've all seen me do this, when someone says something very nice to me, or someone takes the time and writes me a lovely email, every time I go, thank you very much. Thank you for sparing the time. I really appreciate your words and I appreciate you because I have low expectations. I assume it's all not going to end well. So when it does, I'm really grateful. <laughs> Nine, remember to do something that you enjoy every single day. I know the thesis can get overwhelming. I know particularly when the progress is not what you would like, you want to try and work harder and longer and take less and less time to do enjoyable things. But please make sure every single day you do something outside of that thesis that you enjoy. So for me, it's my morning routine. No matter what else is happening throughout the day, I get up at two, I read for an hour, I write for an hour, I go to the gym for a couple of hours, listen to audiobooks, and engage in movement. 
So all of that creates a really pleasant, wonderful morning for me. I look forward to it, it's terrific, and I arrive at work, and whatever happens during the day is fine, because I've put the foundation of joy and pleasure in place at the start of the day. 10. Lean on people that you can trust. Yep. So academic life is ruthless, and it is increasingly ruthless. But it is important that you have people around you that you trust. And those people could be four, they could be just four mates that you're incredibly close to and that's terrific. You can have 40 great mates, all of that's terrific. But just make sure you've got people that you trust and are close to you. That really matters. So if you find yourself getting into a bad place, then be honest and talk to those people that are closest to you and tell them, look, I'm getting myself into a bit of a zone here, a bit of a bad place. Can you help me sort of get out of this? So that means you've got a culture of care and a culture of acceptance around you. Incredibly important. So together, these 10 strategies, I hope, might just pull you out of disillusionment and move you to a culture of success and yes, satisfaction. As always, I wish you love, light and peace. Tia.